So you can just imagine you've been coding for hours and hours and you think you're done, finished your last edits, and you go to assemble your code, you type the A instruction and press return. What? Hi, it's Robin. I have here the Zeus 64 assembler by Crystal. And looking at the back of the box here, it's the Zeus 64 machine code operating system for the Commodore 64. And it talks about how normally the basic ROM interprets your basic, but with Zeus 64, you can quickly and simply write programs in 6502 assembly language and assemble it into a single efficient 6502 machine code program. This gives you two very powerful advantages. You are no longer limited to the commands in the basic language. Many steps that are necessary to interpret a basic statement to machine code will no longer be needed. Therefore, the programs you write with Zeus 64 will run much faster and probably use less memory. I like that qualification. That's actually true. Zeus 64 contains three separate modules. The editor, a fully tokenizing editor, which supports a whole host of features, including view source, renumber, delete lines, multiple source files, etc. The assembler for high speed assembly of source files into 6502 machine code. And the monitor, a full feature monitor for direct inspection and manipulation of both the CPU registers and memory. No less than 20 commands. <laughs> Please note the short description above does not cover all the features offered by this powerful package. Also, the ease of use cannot be described to those unfamiliar with Zeus 64. It just cannot be done. You just have to experience it. So I'm interested in this assembler just on its own right, but as I've probably spoiled with the thumbnail and title, and maybe even a little teaser at the beginning of this video, there's something else kind of funny about this that's really what drew me to it. So we're going to be looking at this assembler somewhat in its own right, in addition to this kind of bizarre little Easter egg in it. Okay, so inside the package, the Zeus 64 assembler instructions, which is a fairly nice booklet showing how to load and run it, and then a bit of a tutorial on using it. Not really how to learn machine language, but just how to use the assembler. And then there's more of a reference manual, both for the assembler and for the monitor, which are integrated, but sort of two different programs. And it was distributed just on cassette, as far as I know. Crystal copyright 1984, vintage computer festival shirt. Okay, so we'll try loading it up. So I've got my PAL 64C here, which I haven't had all that long. And I'm using this because I actually found that this Zeus 64 cassette will not load on my NTSC machine, I think because of the fast loader that's built into it. Okay, so here we go. And I do have my Super Snapshot cartridge plugged in and my micro IEC disk drive is attached, my SD card reader. Okay, shift run. Load, press play on tape. I have noticed that the video output on this machine, the brightness kind of shifts. And I don't know if it's a fault with the machine or if it's my capture device not being used to PAL. Okay, found a Zeus, commodore to load. So if you notice the brightness shifting, anyway, sorry about that. This is not a beautiful machine. The keyboard's kind of yellowed, but the price was right. And it does seem to work well, uh, apart from that possible brightness. Okay, Zeus 6502 assembler now loading. On my NTSC machine, this stalls out after a while. It's kind of funny because tape loaders are actually something that usually do work NTSC and PAL cross compatible most of the time. But for whatever reason, not this one. Okay, here it's loaded. Press stop. Okay, so Zeus dumps us into the machine language monitor that's built into it. <laughs> Depressing, isn't it? Pretty bizarre boot message. The really strange thing is that the copy of Zeus that's on CSDB for download has a much more expected start message. 
But strangely, I'll just show a clip of that. I'm not going to take the time to load that up here. But strangely, that one is actually a cracked version. It even says so when you list the program. I'll just show a capture of that. So this depressing isn't it message, you'd almost think that this is a hack. I mean, I have the original packaging. I have, here's the original tape. I think it's an original. And besides it was mastered, you know, it has a fast loader. If this is some kind of illegal copy, then they went to an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> so I can't really explain that. Zeus bills itself as an operating system because once you've started it up, you can try and stay in this environment. And unless you crash the computer hard, you are able to stay either here in the monitor, and we'll look at this more later, but here you can do things like disassemble code. There you go. Some of the expected things you might, might have seen me do in other videos if you don't do this yourself. But from here you type in Z to go into the Zeus assembler and it tells you you're going to Zeus. Do you want new or old? And this just means are you starting a new program or you try to retrieve one that's already in RAM. So we've just booted it up. So we're going to do a new and now we're in, it doesn't tell us much, but now we're in a different environment. The D command no longer works. If I do D, it gives you an error. The assembler has its own set of commands, and this is where you write assembly language. So it's a little confusing at first, but it's actually a fairly powerful system. Okay, so valid commands include Y. I don't know why, but Y shows a disk directory. And on my SD card, I've already saved some source code I've written in Zeus format. So there's a load command. I'm going to load version four of my code from device eight. Now this isn't like Turbo Macro Pro with a full screen editor. It has kind of a hybrid line editor. It's actually a screen editor like Commodore Basic and it uses line numbers. I'll show you here the V command lets you view the source. This is just like a basic list, except it shows by default 10 lines at a time. And if you press return, it scrolls up another 10 lines worth. I'll press stop to get my cursor back and abort the list. You can see here that we have line numbers, unlike Turbo Macro Pro. Shift return will clear the current line, not delete it from memory, but just clear the screen and allow you to type in a command. Now this is code that I actually converted myself from Turbo Macro Pro, just to get an idea of how the assembler worked. I wanted to use a larger program in it. And I wanted some substantial amount of source code to play with here. So if I assemble, just type A, assembly complete, no errors. And then if I type X, it doesn't exit, it executes the code. You can see it's actually this sprite demo that I did a while ago. I can use the joystick here to move these characters around the screen. The number selects which sprite number. Pressing the button changes the color of the current sprite and I'm moving that C around right now. I can type any letter and it will change the sprite to the appropriate letter. I did a full code walkthrough of this in a previous video. Check the video description for a link to that. I just chose this code as it was a medium sized project that I could use to demonstrate Zeus. Hit restore to exit. And here we are back at the depressing, isn't it? <laughs> monitor prompt. And to re-enter our code, we press Z for Zeus. And this time we press O for old. Well, there's that brightness acting up. And there's no error message. That means it found our old source code that was still in memory. So again, we'll view. So you can just imagine you've been coding for hours and hours and you think you're done, finished your last edits, and you go to assemble your code, you type the A instruction, 
and press return. What? And that happens. Let's <laughs> we'll see it one more time. <laughs> what on earth? I'm going to clear the screen and assemble. Assembly complete, no errors. Okay. So here's the thing. If you just type assemble, nothing happens. If you specifically type one of a very small handful of numbers after A176 being the primary one, then it triggers that Easter egg, which some have said is a bee, but to me looks more like a fly. <laughs> you know, a bug. Now, why it's the number 176? Well, I figured that out by examining the code. In hex, that is B0. And maybe B stands for bug. I don't know. That's my best guess. So first of all, I need to give a shout out to Sark02, who is a user on the Lemon64 forum, who posted about his experience first seeing this Easter egg in Zoo64. And he said nobody believed him. He only got one person replying to him on Lemon, but it was Bradicus who did dig into it enough to verify that, yes, that B or spider sprite, as they were calling it, was actually in the code and that there is some code there to show it. Now here, I'm in the Super Snapshot Monitor, and this is actually the code to display the sprite at B99C, which copies the sprite data down into 200 hex from the assembler down into video memory and so on. I noticed it's had a different memory location than Bradicus found. So that's one more reason why I think this, this version of Zeus is legitimate because it looks like it wasn't just hacked. This version is actually a reassembled version, meaning whoever put this together probably had access to the source code and for whatever reason, change that, put that depressing message in instead of just saying Zeus 64 assembler like the other version did. So it was cool to see that the code existed in there, but what I was really interested in was how to trigger it from within the assembler itself, not using the machine language monitor just to execute that code, but within context, how would somebody encounter this bug during a long coding session? And so what I just showed you, you'll see, I, even though I'm going up by 10 for each of the line numbers here, I deliberately put a line 176 in there <laughs> to make it just slightly more likely to trigger the bug. So I don't know, is there something significant about 176 or is it just the B0 hex, as I mentioned? So I spent quite a bit more time figuring out how to trigger the bug in the assembler. So a highly condensed version of how I found it. So here at B99C, it was pretty easy just by looking around for sprite registers to be written to, to find this routine that copies the sprite data. And here it turns on the sprites, uh, right here, that and this one, and it, D015 enables the sprites. Here the sprite X and Y is put at 80 hex. Now I knew that this was the sprite routine, B99C. So if we hunt through, the assembler sits under the basic ROM. The monitor is right above it from in the C1000 hex area. So we can search all code in Zeus just with that range, hunt from A. 000 to CFFFF, and we want to hunt for that sprite routine address, but in reverse order 9C, low byte first, B9, high byte next. And there it gives us an address for where that routine is called from. So let's look at that B8. I'll start a little further down and scroll up to 1C. So there is the call to the sprite init. 
And what decides if it's called? Well, it takes a look at location 66 hex, masks off the two low bits, and then compares it to B0, and that's that 176 decimal. If it's not true, it branches ahead, and there's that call. So I knew this location 66 would store it, and actually that is where the parameter is stored from the assemble command. So really, you assemble, and you can put a parameter after, and it's only expected to be 0, 1, 2, or 3, and there are just a few different assemble options about what it does with the symbol table, and so that Easter egg was put in there. Anyway, we don't have to get super deep into that, but that's basically how I found it. Although that only flashed the sprite on screen, I thought there would be some sort of way of making the fly stay on the screen for a long time. I spent a long time searching for it, and then I realized that basically it just turns the fly on when the assembly starts and turns it off when it's done. Well, <laughs> the way you get the fly to stay on screen is just to have a long program in memory. So that's why I went ahead and translated an existing program of mine both as a way of learning about Zeus and also just so the fly would buzz around for a few seconds. Okay, so there we go. Assemble. There he goes. That just never gets old for me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's the Easter egg. While we're here, I'm just going to share some of the things I learned about Zeus. It might even be something you want to try using uh, instead of Turbo Macro Pro. It's a decent package, especially for 1984. So I'm just going to discuss uh, what I learned about it while working on this. So first, the differences from Turbo Macro Pro. I already mentioned line numbers. Overall, I prefer Turbo Macro Pro where you can just scroll up and down in the window like a more modern text editor. but I'm okay with line numbers, uh, given that at least we have the full screen editor, and it does make editing pretty easy. And you can view any particular range. If you want to start on line 1000, or if you want to list a whole range of them, and that's 100 lines in total. So that's okay. Okay, this was a pretty bizarre one. <laughs> Might notice that this is forever. That is actually forever. So I'm going to show you what happens. Line 240. If you type forever in, it parses that as a label F here in the left label column. And then here in the opcode column, you notice it auto formats a lot like Turbo Macro Pro does, but incorrectly here, then it puts the or ever over here. And I think what it's actually doing, seeing or as an operator, as a logical operator, not as an opcode, but as an assembly time operator, just like a plus sign or the, some of the other math you can do during assembly. And then it's probably interpreting ever also as its own label. Either way, if we try to assemble now, that is now a syntax error because it can't parse or ever. In the entering and editing text section, it talks about how labels uh, can be up to 31 characters in length. It must not be identical to a reserved word like L LDA. However, a label may contain reserved words is an or a reserved word? Well, then that's on the next line here. A label must not contain operators. And that's what or is. So I don't know. I think that's a very big shortcoming. But I mean, it's, it's not that hard to work around. You know, the very first time I ever used this program, I did this. Border EQUDO20, right? And I got that B order, same bug because of the OR. So not being able to have the sequence OR, which is a very common one as a label, that's, that's really annoying. <laughs> but I guess I can understand that it's just like, you know, you want to be able to do 
five plus five, you don't have to go five plus five. So therefore five or five, five or five. I don't know. And I'm just gonna delete line number 245. And once again, continuing with differences from Turbo Macro Pro, instead of using the asterisk for the origin that you assemble to, it's the ORG, pseudo op or directive load A. Those are actual processor instructions. These are ones that tell the assembler how to behave. So in Turbo Macro Pro, you would go star equals there instead of ORG. And instead of using the equal sign, you have to use the EQU. That's also common. The first full assembler I ever used was Merlin, and it used a lot of these same ones. ENT, that's your entry point. And when you hit the X command to execute, it will go to the last ENT in your code. That's actually an improvement over Turbo Macro Pro, which as far as I know, will only start executing code at the very top, which has caused me some trouble before. So that's a nice feature. And down here at the bottom, instead of the dot byte directive, this uses DFB, I think define byte. An annoyance was in Turbo Macro Pro, I had it like this. This symbol here means take the high byte of what follows. So this is a 16 byte address and the high byte is the D0. Zeus does not support that, so instead I had to just do D0, manually put the high byte in. That's no problem really at all. It's just that it lacks clarity showing what you actually intend, like that this is a 16-bit address and you're taking which byte you're taking. It's just better clarity. But, you know, it wasn't that hard to work around or anything. It does have a DFL and DFH directive, but you can't use that in an operation like this. It's only while you're defining it. And then that seems, I don't know, doesn't seem very useful to me. Turbo Macro Pro also allows you to define a block for local labels. So you can reuse labels like common ones like loop. But in this case, uh, that block wasn't allowed. So when I was porting this, I just, I was lazy. I changed it to loop. 1a instead of giving it a whole new name so i miss those local labels a bit but in a just a medium-sized project like this it isn't that big a deal and another thing is that you can't have a label on a line by itself it has to have an opcode after it fortunately you can do a comment on a line by itself but you see how it's actually st still doing some weird formatting here the first word is treated like a label, and then all the rest is formatted over here because I, I didn't put those spaces in here. It automatically does that. Get, do, 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 source, character byte. A little bit strange. Uh, but yeah, you can't just go loop four, and then you have to have some code on that line as well. Sometimes I like to have the label on its own line. It just makes the code look a little cleaner to me. Again, not a really big deal. Okay, so those were some differences in Zeus that I found were kind of annoyances. How about some nice features? Well, it is kind of nice that when you type a line number, you can actually press this back arrow key and it acts as a tab to the next field. But of course, the code auto formats later when you list it anyway. And while the line numbers are a bit of a nuisance, there are commands to help deal with that. I'm gonna try R for renumber. And now if we view, you see it's renumbered them starting at line 10 and so on. It even got rid of my line 176. And it will also do automatic line numbering with the I command starting on line 10. And again, you can give it, whoops. And you can even do stuff like if you want to start line number one and go up by ones. There you go, semicolon for comment, test, this. Shift return to exit that. And while you can list by line number, like I already showed, you can also 
list by label name. So I've got some labels like weight. And you see here it's listed starting at that routine. So that's really quick actually for finding the code that you want as long as you label it sensibly. And there's also a find command. For example, anything with a knit, and you can even do it on opcodes, find all the load X's. Considering that the code is apparently tokenized, that's a pretty nice feature. T will show the symbol table. No, it won't, because I, I guess I have to assemble again. There we go. T should show the symbol table. There it is. So those are all the symbols and what they got equated as. That can be handy. And the old and new commands will actually take a parameter. So this is kind of dangerous, but I'll try it. I'll go new at 8,000. And I'll view the code here. Okay, and let's go test. Okay, so I've created a new source file in memory at location 8,000. Now I'm going to use the old command to hopefully flip back to the original one. That's the default of 0801, the star basic. And let's view. Yeah, so there is our code. Okay, and now I can go old back to 8,000 and view that. And there's our little test program. So that's pretty cool that you can actually have multiple source files in memory and use the old and new commands. It's like super dangerous too. Like you could totally mess things up if you did the wrong address or whatever, but it's quite a bit of power if you know how to use it. Just oh, on its own should send me back to our original source file. Yep. Okay, and then Q exits from the assembler back to the monitor. Okay, so we're done with the assembler, but let's just look at a few of the interesting things in the monitor before we finish up here. Of course, it does most things you'd expect, like loading and saving binary files, but it does some sort of unusual things too, like the E command, I think evaluates, I don't know, converts. And if you type in a hex number there, like hex one, two, three, four, it shows you that in decimal, that's 4660. Oh, I erased that. I'm in the habit of using shift return, and it clears the line in this. And it also handles decimal numbers. If we do decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that evaluates as hex 3039. Well, that's handy. Here's a weird one. It'll do offset calculations where say you had a branch at location C023 and you want to calculate how big of an offset it is branching ahead to C027. And that is a branch offset of two. It's not four because the branch actually takes up two of those bytes. And if you want to go backwards from C023, say to C010, then the offset is EB. The high bit is set indicating a backwards or negative branch. So this calculates that for you. Kind of weird, but it might come in handy if you are hacking binary files sometimes. Now, if you're using Supermon or the Super Snapshot Monitor, you would probably just use the assemble command. Well, <laughs> maybe part of why they give this to you here is because you don't have an assembler in this monitor. Sure, you've got the whole Zeus assembler, but that's kind of its own unit. Here in the monitor, there isn't a small assembler. It will disassemble, as shown, but in most monitors like Supermon or Super Snapshot, there's an assemble command. You know, you would go assemble to C1000. Well, that does nothing here. Well, actually, it doesn't do nothing. What it does is you can just put some characters on here and those will set tabs. So now when I press the back arrow, it tabs to wherever I put those X's. Kind of a weird feature, but... Okay, that's not the only non-standard thing about this monitor. 
if you examine a location in memory, say 4000, most monitors will show a whole bunch of memory dumped, but this just shows one byte at a time and lets you edit it. A9, so that's the load A immediate opcode, load zero, and so on. So you can walk one byte at a time through memory. Shift, return to exit that. So if you do want to show more memory at once, that is the tabulate command, tabulate 4000. And it only shows one line at a time, though you can do a range from 4000 to 4030, show eight lines worth, I think. One, two, three, well, I don't know, it showed seven. <laughs> I'm not sure. not sure what that parameter means, but so there, you could edit memory in a block like that. T for tabulate, but the confusion continues because on a lot of monitors, T actually means transfer memory as in copy it. So this actually uses C to copy. So C just does a direct copy from one location to another. In other monitors, that sometimes is a compare. And this has an I command that's an intelligent copy that allows you to move code around and it will automatically update the addresses involved. Potentially handy, although in other monitors, I is used for interpret. So it is pretty weird with all these commands getting changed around. Not necessarily wrong, but a standard did emerge based on Supermon, Super Snapshot, Action Replay, and then even the built-in modders and combo machines like the Plus 4 all used more or less the same standard commands. So this is non-standard. Not as weird as Epix, though. Epix fast slow monitors, really weird. Okay, and one more neat thing here. The R command, as most monitors, shows the various registers. If you set the PC to our code, 4000 hex, that's where we assembled that sprite demo. Then if you use Q, now while Q in the assembler quit to the monitor, Q in the monitor doesn't quit to basic, that's actually the X command. Q will do a quick trace. So if we do that and we see the addresses as the code is executed, their border color gets set to black. And now some of this code gets executed and it should actually clear the screen, I think. Coming up on that soon. So it's actually showing the addresses in memory that of what's getting executed. <laughs> oh, did it crash? Oh, I pushed it too far. I'll do a reset. See if it'll let's back in 49152. Oh, there. <laughs> okay, we're back in the monitor. Normally, Hame Restore allows us to pop back to the monitor here, but this time I had to do a reset. Sys49152 gets us back in. Okay, 4000. Quick trace. Okay, and I'm going to press stop to quit that. And I'm going to change the PC again to 4000. So instead of just quick trace, there's one here called W for walkthrough. And it does the same thing, stepping through the code, but actually shows you on the first line, all the registers. And on the next line, the next instruction that's going to be executed. So we're storing A in DO20. And now, so you see, we're just walking through here, our code. I print a clear screen, pushing things on the stack, and so on. I'll stop before it crashes. It's pretty neat. It's not like bulletproof or anything, but it is pretty cool to be able to step through your code on real hardware. Okay, that's it for the Zeus 64 assembler. The only Commodore 64 assembler I'm aware of that deliberately has a bug built in, but you have to work a bit to, uh, to see it. Okay, thanks to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.